who, 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 whose experience is in which segments. If somebody is experienced in a building section, then he should be aware of the construction technologies and associated procedures, all these things uh, to his projects. Means what he has written in his summary of experience. He should be aware of all the construction practices, model, uh, the latest techniques, what he is practicing in his project, all these things. So he should expect the questions from his case study. So, so that is what RICS wants. They covered all the all types of structures. But in this presentation, <clears throat> we have limited ourselves to uh, buildings. Uh, I have not. Uh, we have gone into because uh, this infrastructure projects, buildings, and all those uh, bridges and uh, tunnels and all those things. Because uh, to cover all these things completely means it will be a very maybe, maybe two or three sessions are required. But anyway, we will, we will as a starting point, we will do the buildings. We'll see how the building how. Uh, how we can go, uh, how these different elements in the building and how are the techniques adopted uh, under this uh, this uh, this particular presentation. Now, understanding design and construction process commonly in, used in industry that is pertaining to each individual's project. Uh, if if somebody is experienced in, or somebody is working in a building project, he should be aware of this. If somebody is working in an infrastructure project, he should be aware of his project. So like that. Then let us say detailed knowledge of construction solutions. See, this construction solutions means in the sense this is this is reaching to the level three, uh, means uh, advisory level. So some, somebody is saying, okay, what type of building you will choose for so and so requirement, or if 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 a client wants say uh, you know a, a warehouse to be constructed or a showroom to be constructed, or you want a hotel building to be constructed, how what kind of construction solutions, what kind of building, uh, things like that. So uh, that is that is this the, the construction solutions means that it's an advisory level. Let us know. Level one, nine, two, three requirements. Everybody knows about this one. Anyway, <coughs> let me just to you know refresh your memory. Level one is demonstration of knowledge, understanding stages of uh, the three points are there, like stages of design to come ins inception to completion, various elements of building, uh, sustainable construction technique. These are knowledge level, means demonstrative knowledge, definition level. If somebody asks what is sustainability or what is uh, what what are the building elements you are aware of. Such, such type of questions you can expect at level one. Level two is application of your knowledge, means how the design and constructions are interrelated and understanding alternative construction techniques, things like that. And level three, as we discussed earlier, it is the advisory level. So you have to advise on types of, uh, on maybe, maybe some, some guy can ask a question like, what type of foundation will you advise? So things like that. That, that kind of advisory questions you have to expect at level three. Okay. Now, <clears throat> another question. Now, why QS has to achieve level three in construction technology and uh, environmental services? Because we are all QSs, we are all practicing QSs. We will we'll think that this is a bit of technical, not like, you know, not into cost or contracts or something like that. It's purely technical. Why we need to achieve this one? Anybody can answer this question? Anybody has an idea? Can just please comment on the comment box. What according to you, because RICS is mandating that a candidate should achieve level three in order to uh this construction construction technology so why why they have they have mandated this one why not level two or level one because it, as from a qs perspective somebody can think that this is not our uh, area of expertise uh anybody anybody can answer this one okay let's move on so there are two Yes, uh, somebody was raising uh, the hand, so that's why I stopped. Anybody has any question? I hope the screen is working perfectly now. Okay, since there's nothing, yeah, we'll we'll move on. So, first of all, why this has to be achieved level three is one is cost aspect that everybody know because we have to understand the construction technology, the processes behind each activity, so that we will have a better understanding of the cost or we can come up with the cost more accurately. That is the prime most uh, importance of this competency uh, by studying this competency. So say a foundation. So if you are, if, if you are, uh, if you are to uh, cost a foundation, then you need to know uh, what, what type of foundation, how it is constructed, how the logistics arrangements are going to be. So all these things you have to be aware of. At least, if, even if you don't know in detail, at least you have to be aware of, or you can uh, you always, yeah, always you can ask uh, your technical team for guidance. But 
as a QS, you need to be aware of all these things. Then only you can price correctly, accurately. So that is the cost aspect. So, and the second and most another important aspect is sustainability aspect. As quantities, chartered quantities are ways, we are, we, we, we are, we should be sustainable, uh, sustainably conscious. Means we should always preach sustainable uh, uh, construction or we should always advise our client to care about sustainability. That's important. Be means uh, whenever there is an, there is a chance to push forward the sustainability aspect and with that we should do that. So we should be aware of all the construction technologies, all the latest sustainable or non-sustainable methods, or uh, maybe we can achieve the same, uh, same within the same cost, within the, within the same quality, we can achieve using another, another alternate sustainable uh, methodology. So that we have to advise the client. If we have to advise the client, we have to know the construction technology and the techniques behind the each and every construction activity or the process, entire process. Then only we can advise it. So that these are the two major major aspects. Then this is why RICS is insisting that each uh, RICS professional or chartered professional should attain this competency team, competency at level three. It's, uh, usually these 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 questions are asked in uh, APC. This kind of question is asked in repeatedly asked in APC interview. Four participants raised your hand. Okay, once again. Okay, so let's move on now. So the building elements. Now this is the core part. We have come in the core part of the uh, presentation. Building elements. Let us see the, the question. What is an what is an element? What do you understand by an element? Anybody can answer this question? Just please comment on the comment box if we, if anyone can answer the question. What do you understand by an element? It's actually an element means it's actually a functional unit. It, it is this it is divided into each functional unit. So, so like sub, uh, uh, substructure, it's a functional unit. Superstructure, it's a functional unit. Finishes, it's another functional unit. So element by definition, if you want to go by the definition, we'll see the definition what it is. Element may be defined as a major physical part of the building that fulfills a specific function. That's it. It's a functional unit, irrespective of design or specification of construction. Irrespective of, it's purely functional. Element is defined as a major physical part of a building that fulfills a specific function. So now, how to identify various elements? That's another question. So now you know what is an element in a building. So now how to identify? There are, a building means there are many parts, innumerable, numerous parts. So how will you identify various elements? How to bifurcate this one? Who has provided a rule? Say that, okay, up to this, 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 uh, this, uh, this is an element and maybe something else, it's a different element. So how to, how to identify various elements? In order that we have to adopt some guides or we have to, uh, we have to, you know, take the help from some guides. One is RIBA plan of work. Okay, RIBA plan of work provides us some guidance, how to identify these. And the second one and major, most important one is BCIS. BCIS provided a guide. They have given uh, this elemental breakdown of all F building. Uh, means all, even elemental and sub-elemental also. And they have de uh, defined each and every element. So if you go into BCIS uh, cost plan or the, that format, they have got a format. And in that format, they have explained all these things there. So in order, if you want to further research or further, uh, you know, study on this one, I will suggest that you go by this BCIS document. I will show you in the next slide. Riba stages. This is the 2020. Now you know uh, this is all. Everybody is familiar uh, on this one. But how is this related to the uh, building our construction technology, or uh, uh, how uh, how this Riba stages? Riba stages is all, like we all know strategic definition, then project uh, briefing, concept design, special coordination, technical design, and so on. And so on. it goes so and so. So how is this related to this competency? We'll see. We'll see now. For this one, okay. These are the various um, uh, I have I have written up to the uh, construction stage because this is the ma maintenance and all the I have not put here. But here you can see strategic definition. This is business case related to the document cost document. I am talking about preparation and briefing project budget. We have we, at this at that stage we will the cost information associated with that uh, that stage is project budget. And now concept design it moves on to the cost plan. How the cost plan is prepared. This is where the elemental building elemental thing comes in. That means we have to be aware of 
the elemental breakdown of the building then only we can prepare the cost plan with the information available with the concept design maybe all all information are not available it depends how the design has developed so then spatial code i'm i'm just talking about the correlation now spatial coordination it is updated cost plan then technical design the design is complete and bo that everybody knows so now this is how this is what the riba stages say riba stages say you have to prepare cost plans at concept design stage and spatial coordination so this cost plan means elemental cost plan elemental cost plan means you have to identify the elements and for identifying the elements and make uh, preparing the cost plan you need to be aware of each and every elements and the construction technology and the construction processes behind each and every elements then only you can price the or you can prepare these kind of documents so this is one requirement then second one bca as a, as a guide now bca is documents this is this i think everybody can see because this is a small little bit small uh, small kind of the letters are little small but even though you, i think everybody can see this one here element and how these elements have been uh, what uh, bifurcated by cis It, they have given all elements here based on this now we will will follow our the presentation will follow the same format like substructure superstructure frames upper floors like that like that we will discuss each and every element and the construction technologies associated with those things so now let's move on so building elements as classified by bcis first one is facilitating works second one is substructure so, uh, then superstructure finishes fittings furnishings and equipments services prefabricated buildings and building units this prefabricated building and building units i would say that this is little bit you know may some cases it may come it may not come but we have to be aware of this these kind of techniques uh, this prefabrication how it is done how the cost uh, uh, from the traditional uh, building methods how it is different how it is advantageous these things but this is a quite a different topic actually not uh, it, it in itself is a it's a, is a topic uh, we can do a presentation on a separate presentation on this prefabricated building and building this is such a vast vast um, uh, topic but again you have to be aware of the construction technologies behind the prefabrication then works to existing building this kind of repairing uh, repairing works and all those things then uh, external works external works as you, the by the definitions by the terms itself everybody is familiar out with all these things facilitating works what is it the term itself says it is facilitating works means uh, enabling works then substructure uh, you know uh foundation related works superstructure you know finishes fittings equipment all these things by terms itself everybody can identify this so because we are all familiar with this kind of these works now let's move on we will take each one by one and discuss what are the construction technologies associated with this one now let us see facilitating works now the facilitating works means work to provide a clear site that's all that means be before commencing the construction work the site needs to be clear all these things has to be done now some three uh, they have subdivided it into as per bcs this facilitating works has been subdivided into six part, parts that i have identified bullet as bullet points you can see in your screen toxic hazard containment material treatment major demolition works if there is anything temporary supports to adjacent structures means adjacent like if it, if it is in a this construction is in a city con congested area adjoining buildings are there uh then uh, before excavating you need to give supports like shoring underpinning and things like that we have to do that okay that kind of works will come in then specialist ground works if there is any specialist ground works required then that has to be done temporary diversion works always we know traffic diversions and all those things will come under that one then extraordinary site investigation works extraordinary site investigation works in the sense it means archaeological uh, in, in Qatar we experience this thing because whenever we go to some site there will be some heritage uh, structures will be there uh, there could there could be some ancient uh, you know uh, burial grounds are there this needs to be uh, protected so these kind of things for, for this site investigation works has to be carried out like we have to do some archaeological survey or things like that specialist work uh, so so that comes under this one uh, extraordinary site investigation works okay now facilitating works this is just a just uh, no, bullet points how these elements uh six elements and the sub elements associated with each elements so toxic hazardous contaminant material treatment it has been again subdivided into toxic hazardous material removal contaminated land treatment then eradication of plant growth eradication of plant growth we will discuss in detail because this is not like just like uh, you know uh, the shrubs and whatever uh, tree or something like that 
because we will we, we know that we always remove some palm trees are there in the site we have to remove and relocate it in in middle east we have we encounter those such kind of works uh, but uh, this eradication of plant growth in the sense it is little bit more where means there are some invasive plants are there some plants are categorized as invasive plants invasive plant in the sense means they are very hazardous to the construction itself they will even um, you know uh, uh, destroy the foundation even the slab base slab slab on grade all this they will they will destroy it, walls and all so such kind of plant growth how to eradicate that these are specialist works you will you might need a specialist subcontractor and all so if any such uh, such kind of thing is there on the side then you have to take care so that is why it's a separate item there then major demolition works point number 2 that is you we all know what is demolition works okay soft strip works demolition works then so all these things then the another important point is site dewatering that also we will discuss what are the uh, different types of dewatering methods adopted in the construction because this is an this, this we come across in our day to day life also i uh, means in our everyday project life we come across these kind of situations then soil stabilization method another important thing then like i said extraordinary site investigation includes what archaeological investigation that's what i said earlier then reptile wildlife mitigation methods uh, this reptile wildlife mitigation person here also there are something uh, but um, in uk and all there are some uh, they they know this beavers and all it's very protected you cannot do if there is a, if there is any, any such thing is identified on the site then you have to do you have to inform uh, uh, the authorities then they will give you the guidelines how to do all these things okay so that kind of thing is uh, comes under that uh, that particular heading then extraordinary other extraordinary side if anything else is there like in addition to this, if anything other extraordinary condition is there, which needs to be investigated, then that that comes onto this this item. Okay. Now let us go into this toxic hazardous containment material. What all what all uh, we come across this one? Uh, just I have just put some pictures for easy identification. One is the first one, the central one is asbestos removal. As we all know, it's an hazardous material. If you have to remove this, then we have to, you know, specialist has to come in. Then they have to do as per the protocol. They have to do this one. You cannot uh, just go and uh, dismantle that. So that's a specialist work. We will see removal of contaminated ground material. See in situ treatment. The photograph itself is it is self-explanatory. But anyway, you can see that the material has to be removed. In situ treatment. They will they will bring in some. Um, uh, so there could be some. It could be chemical treatment, or they can bring they can remove the soil and can um, replace it with a, a good quality soil. Things like. Then this is. Uh, uh, Okay. So third one is uh, the excursion and disposal chemical treatment. I don't know how this came in. Anyway, that is not the correct picture. Right? And anyway, it is it's related to the uh, eradicate the plant growth. The picture, the plant in the picture is uh, Japanese knotweed. It's a common problem in UK. Uh, Japanese uh, knotweed is it's rated as now. It's it's a very highly invasive plant, and it destroys buildings and it's a very huge, major problem in UK. Uh, so uh, they have got specialist subcontractors uh, working on this one. Uh, this is not like you know just you go bring some excavator or it, it, remove it, cut it. It's not like that. It's chemically treated on a uh, step by step basis. Uh, it takes it, it, it takes a quite a some time, like um, uh, some few weeks time the, for the, the site is completely closed and uh, it is repeatedly treated. Uh, then there will be some boats or uh, bo they, they will be some uh, you know. Uh, uh, demarcation will be there. Uh, there will be some uh, warnings will be there, so people should not go in there because it is chemically treated area like that. In order to eradicate this plant, because it grows again, even if you remove it, it grows again. So that's a problem with that plant. That can particular kind of plant. Then, as we discussed earlier, this is asbestos removal. That's a removal of toxic hazardous part of building metal fabric. So these kind of things you have to take care, and you have to understand the, this. Especially these kind of contaminated material, this will come under specialist subcontractor. Whenever you have this thing in your contract, or whenever you comes across comes across this kind of works, then you understand that there will be some sub specialist subcontract involved. Then you have to understand the, uh, the, the then you have to you know uh, from the cost perspective, you have to understand that that particular cost will come in into your uh, overall cost. So that you have to take care while planning. Now major demolition works. These are some few techniques which we adopt for uh, demolishing works uh, it includes like the picture itself is self explanatory we can we know this is crane and ball with where a crane is a, a, a very heavy uh, ball metal ball is used to is uh, swung uh, to demolish the building it's very common uh, technique it's, it's quite old actually 
in congested areas, in city areas, all uh, this kind of techniques cannot be adopted because you know things can fly around. If you if you hit it uh, with a ball like this, then things can fly around. It can cause some uh, you know health safety issues. You can cause so we use some isolated areas. Yeah, of course, some isolated buildings where there is no issues, then you can use this. It is cheap one uh, compared to compared compared to other techniques. It's quite cheap, and you cannot use this for all buildings. Also, some small temporary buildings you can use this one. Then this is another one. This we see everywhere. Even if you in this, uh, I think uh, that roundabout uh, next to Jaida, when we go through the Bing Road, uh, B, B Ring Road, we have uh, demolished a building there using this technique because there was an excavator where they um, brought down the building there. So this is the this is the technique, which means that there will be a base machine. It will have a, have a boom and then and then uh, a primary tool. Usually a break that will be fixed at the end of the mm -hmm. boom. Which will be used to demolish the building. So we are, you are all uh, pretty uh, familiar with these kind of things. Then the other one is implosion. Uh, this is this also uh, we have seen many many buildings uh, being demolished in this way. Uh, like how this has been done is these explosives are used here. Uh, there, there should be special care should be taken while handling these kind of things. Health and safety issues are there. Uh, so authority permission permissions are required. So all these things have to be done. How this is done is explosives, limited explosives, calculated amount of explosives are kept on structural points uh, identified in the building, uh, and it is um, it's it's uh, detonated at, in a sequence so that the building um, collapses into inside. It's not going; it is imploding. It will fall uh, into the into on top of one another. The structure will collapse in itself, uh, and uh, that way we can demolish. We can. We can remove them. Now, now in the facilitating box, we'll move on. The next one item is site dewatering and pumping. This is one. This is a major item. In uh, uh, we always encounter this kind of box in our day-to-day uh, -day project life. So that's why I thought it's important, and we'll have a discussion on this one. Uh, everybody might be aware of some, uh, you know, techniques adopted here. These are the few techniques. The, these uh, the, there are three drawings I have put on screen now. You can see that uh, these are. Quite quite uh, common techniques which is adopted uh, for the dewatering system. Let us see. One is called a sump pumping system. This is the most common technique uh, where we'll make a sump within the excavation area. We'll make a sump so that the water will collect it within the sump, and from there we'll use a pump to dewater, pump it outside. That's what the sump pumping system is. The another one is well uh, wells point system. Wells point system means where the water table is quite high. What we'll do is we will pull put series. Series of wells along. You can see along the perimeter of the excavation, series of small wells pipes are drilled into the water table. From where and from there, uh, the uh, water is pumped out so that the water table gets ready, uh, lowered. You can see the water uh, below in the in the figure. You can see that the water table has gone like an arc. At the po at the point of wells, it has dipped. That means the water table has gone down, and so that you can work on the your working area is not uh, you know uh, wet or it's not submerged anymore. So, like likewise, the other one is deep well system. This is for deep excavation also, uh, where deep wells are uh, bored into the uh, bored along the side. Maybe one or two, or maybe uh, depending upon the height of the water table or requirement, or the amount of water incoming ingress, uh, maybe two or three or more can have have. Based on this, what they will do is they will bore a well and use a submersible submersible pump for uh, pumping the. Water out because of the depth, we you need a submersible system. Here in well point system, it's not a submersible pump. The pump is above. It's not submersible pump. For because of that, it has got depth limitation. Okay, you cannot go beyond certain limit. If you want to go, if if you want to go beyond certain depth, then you are, you need to have well, multiple well point systems. At up to one depth, you can use this uh, particular. Maybe like up to three meters, you will use this one. Then what? After, once it reaches uh, three meters, if the excavation is going further, four or five meters. Then again, you have to uh, set up the same uh, uh, system again at, uh, at that uh, three meter depth. Then from there again, you have to use a second system to uh, de uh, dewater. But in deep well system, you will go up to the depth required depth, and from there itself, you will pump the water out so that the entire excavation will remain. You don't need to have multiple systems. One system will work, but it is a little bit costly compared to the well point system. Now let's move on. Soil stabilization method. 
as i have discussed earlier this, this is also an important uh, or uh, quite common uh, problem encountered uh, while facility cleaning works uh, that is the soil or underlying underlying layer is not ha having enough bearing capacity or it is weak structure in such cases we go for soil stabilization methods quite common uh, techniques i have uh, are, um, outlined here you can see from the pictures itself it's quite a uh, but easy to understand and from the name itself you will you will understand what is behind what is the technique adopted here so let us go by first one is vibro compaction vibro compaction is nothing uh, you are vibrating it like we are compacting the concrete we use vibrators now. similar same technique here we are just using vibrator to vibrate the soil loose soil which will settle which will uh, which will compact okay that's this vibro compaction then there is another one called vibro stone compactions columns uh, what is this one this is we will dig we will dig a pit like you know like a pile a pit we will make then we will fill that with stones crushed aggregates and compact those aggregates this will form like a, a column like a pile only we are using concrete for pile or maybe we are using steel for instead of this we are using aggregates for filling the this uh, we are uh, we are boring a hole and filling it with the uh, this what you call aggregates and then compacting it so the soil surrounding it will it will, that uh, this pile will get consolidated as well as what happens is the bearing capacity will increase because you are essentially you are putting piles around the entire surface maybe around five, 10 meter interval descent, uh, depending upon the bearing capacity required and the soil conditions characteristics and design parameters you we, we, you may have to put uh, 10 meter interval you have to put one vibro stone column so like that essentially you are putting stone piles uh, that's why broke stone columns that's how you increase the bearing capacity of the soil then the other one is ground freezing it's it's a chemical technique actually ground freezing it's a very old technique also what happens is say suppose uh, this uh, this is particularly used for uh, you know uh, safeguarding uh, embankments while we are excavating what happens is if the embankment is very or if you are excavating nearby an embankment or a soil fill area where the soil is very loose or uh, if there is a chance of collapse and all we need to stabilize the soil then only we can make an excavation there in the nearby that uh, that particular section so what we will do is we will use some chemicals we will we'll put pipes okay pipes inside the soil will penetrate uh, the pipes uh, will penetrate to desired depth and some coolant will be uh, like uh, some chemical coolant will be run through these pipes, uh, freezing, freezing compounds like um, maybe like uh, uh, liquid nitrogen or something like that. They will use what essentially happens is they are cooling down the soil. Means the, there will be water always in the pores. Um, pore water will be uh, there in within the soil. That pore water gets freeze because of this freezing. The pipes get freeze. Then surrounding soil will be cooled down. And it will go to uh, go to a freezing point where the pore water gets freezed. And by by doing that, what happens is the soil itself, entire the soil itself will act as a solid mass, solid ice mass in effect. And it will be stabilized; it will not collapse. It will get adequate strength so that it will remain there. And uh, once the excavation is done, okay, you can backfill or whatever you can do. You you can carry out with your work. That is one way of uh, that is a ground freezing, and that is one way of uh, stabilizing weak soils, especially for in case of excavations near to uh, weak embankments or weak soil structures then micro piles are there micro piles uh, we make uh, in this this case what uh, what happens is this is essentially we are piling the entire area we will use very 5 to 12 mm diameter piles we are usually driving it it's pre cast piles only we will drive it into the ground and the foundation is made above that one that means the pile will transfer the load it will act as a pile only but very small pile that's all uh, and uh, these small piles these precast piles there will be numerous ones it, the entire area will be covered with the piles like uh, maybe one meter two meter depth depending upon like i said the soil characteristics and based on the uh, design parameters they will decide the distance between the piles and by that the, uh, based on that we will drive the piles around the uh, and uh, around the perimeter and in, in within the entire area and the uh, foundation will be, maybe there will be, if it is a rough foundation or a mat foundation then it, the mat will be casted on top of this piles then soil nailing the other other technique this is just uh, like you can see in the picture it's just a mat mesh and it is nailed anchored onto the soil so that the slope doesn't come off or it doesn't collapse this is a slope uh, actually slope protection method 
uh, rather than uh, you know a ground improvement method it's a slow protection method the other one is soil preloading it is similar to uh, vibrostone com compactions where the soil itself is removed and um, it's it's it, 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 this using this you know uh, 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 this machine okay one second okay yeah, similar to sto vibrostone, com uh, vibrostone columns, where the soil is stabilized using a vacuum, the vacuum uh, pressure. The, uh, using a vacuum pressure, uh, this uh, the weakened soil, uh, they will re remove the soil and they will replace it. Okay, by that by that way, uh, this is done. The soil will be stabilized. Now let's move on to the next section. Okay. Yeah. So, facilitating works. We have gone through uh, all the all the items, uh, major items like demolition, soil stabilization methods, uh, what dewatering. All these items we have covered. Then the next major element, the next element is substructure. Okay. Now we will uh, discuss what is substructure. Uh, basic question is what is substructure? The, fu the functional definition, as per BCS, it says that it is to transfer the load of the building to the ground. That's okay. I, horizontally isolated from the ground. Whatever is load is coming onto the uh, from the building, that means it's dead weight and the live load. Whatever is acting on the building, it has to be safely transmitted to a uh, to the ground to a safer level or a uh, hard strata. That is what the uh, functional uh, use of this substructure. So, how will you identify at what level? What what is substructure? Up, up to what level you will consider a substructure? Anybody uh, anybody can answer this. One? Up to what level you will consider substructure? Say from this, from the uh, from the figure itself, there is a figure attached here. You can see that there is a basement, first floor, and then above floors are there. You can see from the figure. So, up to what level is is normally considered uh, substructure? As per BCS, their definition. Normally, you will consider substructure up to the floor till the uh, ground level ground or first floor. Of not first floor, ground floor uh, finish means the lowest floor. To, it would say the lowest floor, not even the first floor, the lowest floor. Maybe the lowest floor is a car park. We, we don't know. But lowest floor finish, finish level. That is the uh, below that it will be the substructure, which means including the slab. The finish is not included. Finish is included in the finishes. And below the finish, below the finish level, whatever may be the finish, maybe the tile or uh, epoxy flooring, whatever is the finish is there. Below the finished level, including the slab, is considered as substructure. Okay, so whenever somebody asks you what is up, up to what level is a substructure, this should be your answer. It should be below the lowest floor finish, up to the lowest floor finish, excluding the finish. That is what substructure is. Now let us see what are the different elements or sub elements in the substructure. Standard foundations, specialist foundations, lowest floor construction. As I said, the lowest floor, including the, that whatever is whatever is the lowest floor will come under the substructure and basement retaining walls. These are the uh, common elements coming under the substructure. Now let us see what is sub elements, sub subdivision of this one, standard foundations, walls and column foundations, foundation walls, ground beams. These are all comes under the standard foundation, specialist foundation. Specialist foundations, as you all know, pilings, caissons, and underpinning. Okay, underpinning is actually a, a, a kind of, uh, you know, uh, a kind of precautionary measure or a kind of supporting the system. It's it's not actually a foundation. Uh, Sometimes we, during, uh, we'll, we'll discuss in detail what is an underpinning because during some renovation work or some some, uh, some support, as additional support has to be provided for the foundation. Sometimes the foundation has to be strengthened in certain cases. Then you need to underpin the section, whatever is the load, load which is acting on that foundation, that particular section has to be uh, supported. Uh, that's called underpinning. And in various other scenarios also, we are providing underpinning. So underpinning is not exactly a foundation, but it is also a foundation. It's also classified. Uh, uh, there is any underpinning works, it should come under the substructure. That's what you ought to understand. Then lowest floor construction, beds, slabs, basement slabs, rough foundation, suspended floors, lift pits, ducts, below, which are below the lowest floor. Okay. So these are all which are coming under the substructure. Now basement retaining walls. Basement retaining walls also will basement retaining walls in the sense means if you have a basement and there is a wall which is designed as a retaining wall. I will just go back to the previous slide. Okay, there there is a figure. 
you can see in the left hand side in uh, the, the left side of the screen basement retaining wall see it's a part of the retain basement but it is designed as a earth retaining structure because it is it is adjoining to the earth so it will be designed as an earth retaining structure so this is called a, this is also part of uh, substructure normally if it is not then if it if, if it is not uh, part of the if, in earth retaining structure then it will go into the superstructure normally so we'll see that then basement walls in contact with earth, earth that's what we discussed now then permanent support to excavations that means shoring or something like that now we'll move on standard foundations what are the different types of standard foundations you are aware of this is a level one question normally asked in all apc interviews most of the apc interviews uh, what are the different type of standard foundations you, are, you know so you can uh, you can you can give these examples uh, isolated few footings combined footings strap footing ground beams and strip beams these are the commonly used there are other 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 types also other combinations are also used but these are the most common varieties we use okay uh, isolated footing as you as the term indicates it is isolated means it is individual footing individual to each columns normally the columns column will be uh, the column load will be transmitted uh, to that um, uh, isolated footing and that's called isolated each individual column will have an individual foundation these are not connected with each other okay then combined footing here as the name indicates two foundation two columns will be combined so the, it can it can be either a rectangular section or a trapezoidal section also sometimes it can be a trapezoidal section also it can um, it can come it depends upon the design then strap footing strap footing is also as a type of combined footing but here what happens is when where this is this is happening is when this then the when one one footing is very close to the uh, boundary wall and all so you don't have enough space there so you you tie it to the nearest uh, foundation using a strap it's, it's kind of it's kind of extending it connecting it to here uh, so you cannot put a full uh, 100% combined footing there so you'll go for strap footing the design will change based on that if you, you are using a strap footing then of, of course the design will change combined footing it will have a different design okay, so like that normally uh, columns are close together then you would go for combined footing given enough space are there if it is not enough space like i said if it is near nearby a boundary wall or a nearby a road or something some obstruction is there so be, where you cannot provide a 100% combined footing then you will you can go for a strap footing then ground beams that's plank beam it, it's mentioned there uh, in the drawing itself you can see what is a uh, ground beam uh, it's connecting the columns okay uh, so that is there then strip beam strip beam is nothing uh, normally uh, strip footing for wall or strip footing for column the column the one strip of uh, the um, the it will be excavated and one continuous strip will be poured or um, uh, maybe it may it can be reinforced or can cannot uh, it, it may be uh, plain cement concrete also depending upon the design and load uh, that is it normally for houses and all we you know we, we provide strip uh, strip beams uh, as a foundation so that is what is called strip beam that you can see from the right hand corner lower corner that the wall wall is how the wall is constructed on the strip footing we are all very familiar about with the, such construction so these are the standard foundations now the next section is specialist foundation uh, this is also an important this is also commonly um, asked question types of uh, pile foundation because uh, uh, we are all familiar with uh, different types of uh, pile foundations we have seen in our day to day life also uh, some some guy is boring even if whenever you go outside some construction site building sites normally piles everyone has seen uh, at least everyone uh, you know in the construction industry is familiar about this one well, let, let's just uh, types of foundation let's just go through uh, what are the different types of pile uh, foundation the, you can see that the in the figure also based uh, before that we will do what is a pile foundation how we will define a pile, uh, pile foundation it says that when the depth is more than three times the breadth, it is class considered as a pile. When the depth of the foundation is more than the more than three times the breadth of the foundation, it is classified as a pile foundation. So that is the standard found, uh, definition of the pile foundation. Types of pile foundation based on the load bearing capacity means or load bearing mechanism. This uh, pile foundation is uh, normally uh, classified as two: one is friction piles and end bearing piles. Sometimes both can also happen. A pile can be end bearing as well as friction. Depending upon the design, both can also happen, but uh, or individually, friction piles only and end bearing piles only. End bearing piles mean the, as the name indicates, the load is transmitted through the end. It's end end bearing means the uh, end is resting on a hard strata, probably a rock strata. 
uh, maybe uh, wherever the rock is uh, no rock or very hard or safe strata is available pile will reach up to that strata and the load will be transmitted to that strata okay this is end bearing pile now what happens with the friction friction uh, pile is uh, there will be there is not uh, even no the an economical depth of a pile means you cannot uh, continuously bore like 40 60 meters like that you cannot bore okay so there there should be some some you know uh, there will we will we'll calculate how economic it is how how much depth we can go so like around 20 meter 25 meter we will feel see that uh, if there is no hard strata available at a reasonable depth then we will go for friction piles friction piles in the sense mean it will transmit the load using the skin friction skin friction means the the soil surrounding the pile there will be friction means when the load is acting on the pile the pile will try to move down and the friction will be friction along the surface of the pile will be acting upwards we all know that it's pretty simple very very simple sense so the load is transmitted through this friction and uh, the, such piles are called friction piles okay skin friction the the load transmitting thing is um, skin friction uh, whereas in end bearing piles it is the end which is uh, means it, it is transmitted through the end bearing of the pile means it is bursting on a hard strata that is what the, that is what the uh, classification of piles based on uh, its load transmitting or its design or uh, how the stand uh, how the load is transmitted to the uh, earth that is how the uh, piles are classified two types of piles then different types of piles based on the materials timber piles steel piles concrete piles we are all familiar with this and the pictures itself we can, you can see steel piles there are steel sheets also means uh, uh, sheet pile is also there steel sheet piles especially used in uh, you know waterfront areas steel sheet uh, sheet piles are used uh, then timber piles you know it's timber only uh, which is driven into the ground using suitable mechanism then concrete piles concrete piles can be uh, we'll see how the concrete piles there are different types of concrete piles methods of pile installation concrete piles how different types of piles are, means concrete piles are installed based on the method of installation how these are classified uh let us see was first one the first one is driven piles which means as the name indicates it is driven into the ground the pre piles usually will be precast uh this uh, precast piles will be driven into the ground uh, also known as displacement piles which means the uh, the, uh, the the soil is not removed means there is no cavity made but instead the pile is forced driven into the ground that means the soil is displaced the uh, load is displaced then second one is bo boring means poured piles means there is a bore made you can see in the figure that there is an auger boring okay that auger auger will we will use that auger to remove the soil make a cavity and the fill the cavity uh, place suitable reinforcement fill the cavity and then uh, you uh, you know use your uh, uh, fill the cavity with the, uh, cement and uh, then uh, that's how that um, uh, piling is done then the second one is screw piles here the pile itself is screwed into the ground you can see in the uh, in the figure how it is done see the there is a this is a screw type thing it's it's left that pile that auger part is left in the ground that is the pile itself that is the pile it is screwed like a screw it's driven into the ground and uh, used as a foundation so that is that's the three types of uh what uh pile foundations now specialist foundations we have discussed and uh, like we had said earlier we'll go into the specialist foundation uh which usually caissons and coffer dams uh, uh specialist foundation one was pile foundation we finished that one now there is caissons and coffer dams what are caissons and what are coffer dams usually we we have come across this uh, particular uh, this uh, terms uh, very often in our life uh, in our professional life we have heard it and efficiently uh, this means that these are particularly used for submerged constructions like uh, submerged foundations like underwater uh, foundations whenever if you have to excavate and put a foundation in uh, inside the water like a river um, foundation for a bridge or um, in in the sea or something like that and you will use for case you go for caissons and coffer dams these are essentially these things are used for to provide a dry work space that is the main aim of this one you can see that we will in the what is caisson is a box like structure commonly used in civil engineering projects where the work is being carried out in the submerged water that's what we had discussed now so in case of there is a underwater foundation needs to be laid we will go for a caisson caisson can be pneumatic open ended or closed end 
in the in this figure in the slide it is a pneumatic caisson where there are two chambers are there one is for pressurized air supply and this you, with this pressure the water is expelled out and the space is kept dry and the other one is the next tube is for the personnel to go down and do the work that's it so there are two two uh, two chambers will be there for in a pneumatic case open kind of casing it is just like a uh, you know well steel or um, steel well it's driven uh, to the ground and then water is pumped out or somehow water is or you can use uh, some techniques to remove the water then you can uh, use that that is uh, that is uh, the open ended case and closed out closed is also there so these are the three different types of caissons there and the coffer dams coffer dams all coffer dams is little bit more simpler and more traditional also because uh, previously also we know how this works we will simply construct a dam around the area which where we want to you know uh, dewater or we want to keep it dry then we will pump the water out and once the entire construction is done we will remove that it's simple as that so that is that is a coffer dam so now what is the difference between a coffer dam and a caisson why we need a caisson and why we need a coffer dam what is the basic difference between these two structural or, or uh, from the construction technology point of view what is the difference between a coffer dam and a caisson so coffer dam means uh, the basic difference between them is for caissons these ca these structures are left in place after the foundation is done these are not removed they are left in place but in case of coffer dams they are removed the coffer dams are removed okay so this is the basic difference or the basic uh, fundamental difference between these two now as we discussed earlier underpinning we'll go and discuss what is underpinning underpinning sorry i'm not underpinning underpinning so underpinning you can see in the um, uh, photographs on the right hand side how this has been done so this is called underpinning where you can see in the first photograph there is a building above at the side of the building has to be excavated maybe there is another building has to be constructed there so that there is a chance that the building will collapse that the foundation even that that base slab is exposed little bit you can see at the uh, corner that the base slab is a little bit exposed so that has to be supported that particular part has to be supported you have to provide a foundation there you have to support the underside or support the existing foundation of the building so that is called underpinning here also uh, in the bottom figure also you can see how that particular edge of the slab has been supported okay so this this is called underpinning structures provided underneath of an existing foundation to maintain its stability it's termed as underpinning now applications where we are using this defective foundation needs to be replaced we discussed earlier also defect wherever defective foundation needs to be replaced yeah so the existing foundation has to be supported we have to provide such, some kind of support like this then do the uh, whatever any replacement or uh, whatever we have to do we have to do the work there then strengthen shallow footings when deep foundation needs to be constructed adjoining to it that is the figure figure number 1 figure number 1 the existing building has a shallow foundation it is not very deep okay and now there is a deep excavation coming adjacent to it because the next adjoining building needs a deep foundation so we there has to be excavation to be done so in such case that shallow foundation needs to be supported otherwise building will collapse okay then safeguard against excessively or differential settlement of foundations in existing structure okay? if there is any differential settlement and all then you need to support it then you need to stabilize so go for some technique investigate and go for some technique maybe you need to stabilize something or some work has need to be done okay in such cases we will go for underpinning then during construction of a basement of an existing building okay if you need to construct a basement for an existing building of course obviously you need to support the building okay you need to provide proper adequate supports then only you can excavate and construct a base, uh, basement so in such cases also you have to do this underpinning then shoring there is an, this is another technical term uh, often confused with the um, underpinning and the questions in apc in, this, in uh, uh, you know interview will also come what do you know about or how you differentiate between underpinning and uh, shoring so you need to be aware of the definition underpinning means uh, you all as you know the supporting the existing foundation now the shoring means it is a temporary structure to support unsafe structure unsafe structure in the sense it is not foundation the structure itself maybe it is a it is a side of an excavation side of the, a wall itself or a side of a wall things like that you can see that uh, uh, in the first uh, figure there are series of piles have been driven to protect that particular slope, embankment slope because we are excavating it this side there is a structure on the other side and the earth need, earth will be if there is no support there the earth will collapse so this is called shoring then in the second figure also it is very quite clear in that one how that particular 
uh, uh, the side or side of that excavation has been supported this kind of this kind of uh, temporary supports are called uh, shoring it is mo most commonly used in excavations see applications when a building wall shows bulging or leaning forward this is what i explained earlier when a wall is going to it's it's, it's under earth pressure maybe some retaining wall okay you have constructed a retaining wall and there is an there is the earth pressure becomes more you know that the earth pressure becomes more during uh, rainfall and all uh, the earth pressure increases and there are chances that the wall will topple if there is not it's not enough uh, uh, no, it's not adequately designed or something like that there is a chance that the retaining wall will topple so that in order to avoid if in such cases you can use uh, shorings for supporting this okay and if there is any if you are going to it's another case if you are doing some excavation or just like in the figures uh, you will provide the shoring temporarily and then once you, after the excavation even your backfilling you will remove the shoring so that there will no there is no issues in the earlier case when the uh, wall itself is bulging you have to repair the wall you provide the shoring and then you repair the wall that's how you do this then dismantling reconstructing defective building wall shoring is provided to support floors or roofs connected to the this wall see connected elements whenever you are doing a, uh, any rectification works to an element element are the other elements which are structurally connected to this particular element you have to support them so or in all these scenarios we use shoring so this is this is basically the difference between shoring and underpinning then form works okay so now basically what we have done, substructure is almost over and before moving on to the superstructure we need to have an understanding on form works what is the form work simple thing everybody has seen a form work so definition this is a level 1 question what is the form work anybody can answer very simple question so you have you have form work so the essential functionality of a formwork is to provide a mold for the concrete to take its form you you have a desired form maybe a rectangle maybe a circle or whatever the form may be depending upon the design you have to create you have to make a mold for the concrete to take that shape that is that for that you need formwork okay so let us see formwork is a term used for process of creating temporary mold into which concrete is poured and formed traditionally formwork is fabricated using timber okay we know that we use timber metals plastic the, the, uh, innumerable materials are there where we can use as form works now another question is what are slip forms and jump forms these are type of form works actually there are different types of form works steel form works are there then doka are there you may you may have specific form works related to your projects also so even if, if this is going into a level 2 question then you have to give examples from your project okay so in that case you will have to use examples from your project where you have come across some certain kind of uh, form work how you have you no know, how that uh, that particular item has been valued costed or something like that say if you are variation you are costing for a concrete then uh, if any kind of special form work has to be included you put that into your cost how you are concerned so such kind of questions or such kind of examples you can give for a level 2 answer okay now now we'll move on what are the what is slip forms and jump forms this is also a norm um, common question in the apc uh, slip forms and jump forms are type of forms these are used for vertical structures actually vertical structures in the sense very high vertical structures usually core walls in a building say at core wall you know it goes from the basement to the top of the building and like lift chambers lift chambers also from the ground floor or from the basement it goes to the top as a continuous uh, continuous structure and uh, other other staircase walls are there so such walls and uh, another example is where this can be used is chimneys okay you have always uh, seen high chimneys uh, for concrete structures big concrete structures so that kind of structures when you want to make slip forms and jump forms comes in very very handy so what are these we'll go into this one so jump forms and slip forms are both systems of concrete construction that use self climbing form works uh, to construct multi story structures typically building cores and shafts as well as chimneys and silos they are both climb form system climb form means climb form means they will climb automatically you don't have to unscrew remove everything and then reset it it can there are hydraulic jacks uh, pneumatic systems are there which will help it to climb to the next level say if the uh, height of the slip form is 
3 meters once the con uh, not uh, slip form jump form is uh, 3 meters once the 3 meters is done it is it will it can be moved like it will climb to the uh, next level and then another 3 meters can be put then it will again climb up then another 3 meters can be put like that you can uh, um, achieve it till the required height so this is jump forms now slip forms slip forms also same uh, technology so what's the difference between these two basic difference between these two the basic difference between slip form and jump form is that this is jump forms is like you no know, once the concrete is poured say the height of the jump form is 3 meters 3 meter height concrete has been poured then the its strength maybe 28 day strength or 14 day strength whatever it is the desired strength at, or whatever the desired strength is achieved in uh, how many days that is there okay. some administrators are added so that the setting time is reduced that is another section so anyway once the required uh, strength is achieved then this then only the form is removed then only the form is allowed to climb up then they will set the, uh, the uh, hydraulic jacks they will work the hydraulic jack so that the, it moves up and the next three meters concrete can be poured in but in slip in case of slip forms these are continuously moving upward okay like it, it never stops and you will continuously pour on uh, keep on pouring the concrete say if the three meters it will have may, may, mostly the slip forms as a rate of climb like 3 mm uh, per hour or um, uh, per day or something like that uh, i exactly don't remember but uh, so it slowly climbs up that means it allows the concrete to set uh, um, uh, settle and it keeps on moving up okay and the concrete is continuously poured set 24 hour actually the pouring happens 24 hours till the desired height is reached especially this this type of form is used especially in the construction of chimneys okay uh, where a monolithic structure is required where there is no where no joint is allowed uh, so in, in that case this slip forms are used in any structure if you want a monolithic structure like there is no joints are um, allowed or desirable then you will go for slip form in vertical structures and jump form you will have joints because the concrete for the two meters you have poured the concrete and you allowed it to set uh, attain its strength then you you are removing it and then uh, moving it uh, for the next uh, or uh, resetting it for the next uh, three meters so every three meter you will have a joint so that is there so if you are not if you don't want that joint then you will have to go for the slip form so this is the basic difference between slip form and gem form now okay we have discussed this then we'll move on these are certain pictures uh, you can see on the top uh, this is a gem form and the bottom it is a slip form bottom two are slip form okay you can see how this uh, the chimney has been constructed here so so that's that's the two types of form works then we'll move on to superstructure Okay, superstructure. What is a superstructure? Frames, then upper flows. These are the sub elements of superstructure roof, external walls, windows and external doors, internal walls and partitions, internal doors. Okay, so these are the seven items. Then sub elements, uh, frame, frame itself. There is no other sub element, frame is frame. Then upper flows. Upper flows has floors, balconies, and drainages to block balconies. Then roof, roof structure, roof covering, especially roof systems. All these things will come under roof. External walls, external enclosing walls, external walls below ground level also. Uh, external soffits, subsidiary walls, facade access, cleaning systems. All these things will come under external walls. Then uh, windows and doors that all, everybody knows. Internal walls and partitions. That's also you are familiar with these things. And internal doors. Now we will discuss on frames. What are the different types of frames? So the figure shows what is a frame structure. Okay. Now let us see functional definition of a frame. What is a, the frame? To provide a full or partial system of structural support where there is where this is not provided by other. That means it is a structural support for the building. Simple as simple as that. This is the structure of the building. The frame gives the structural stability to the building, and everything else. The load is transmitted through the nodes. You can see that the structure where the beams and columns join together. These are called nodes. Of a structure and the load is transmitted through the nodes to the foundation and from there to the hard strata. So this is how the frame works. Now, framed construction, different types of construction. You can see that how the this uh, flowchart uh, goes. You can see the different types of materials used. How this has been um, classified. Framed construction. You can have steel framed frames as well as concrete frames.
sorry there can everybody hear me sorry there was a there was some issue with the network that's why i couldn't uh, it got disconnected please sir, can everybody hear me can anyone please uh, comment down the comment box ah okay okay sorry sorry for the inconvenience huh? my network got disconnected somehow i don't know how that happened uh, anyway we'll move on uh, so i i hope that the screen is uh, visible to everyone if any anybody can see the screen or if the screen is not moving then please uh, message me so now concrete versus steel okay before that before that we were we were discussing okay we, uh, we were discussing yeah precast and post tension uh, pre tension okay now we will move on frames uh, and the, uh, within frames we will see concrete versus steel this is also this is also uh, another uh, another uh, you know uh, very frequent question in the um, uh, apc uh, it can go up to level 3 also means that this type of question can go level 3 also like they will give you a scenario say in this particular location uh, i want a parswan so building say if a, a, a say a workshop is required or maybe a show room is required or a, or, a, or a residential complex is required or something like that so in this case how you, which type of construction you will recommend uh, this steel or concrete so you need to understand the basics like what are the advantages of uh, concrete over steel or both we cannot say that concrete is better or steel is better both are very excellent construction uh, materials and uh, uh, so you have to understand the uh, uh, pros and cons of each of the items and then uh, accordingly you have to modify your answer uh, according to the scenario given by the uh, panel so now let us see what is what are the advantages uh, what are the main points in the concrete concrete with concrete concrete gives large cross sections that is when you design with concrete concrete gives large cross sections uh, normally uh, because the concrete as you all know these uh, concrete cannot take tensile stress only compressive strength can, concrete can sustain only compressive strength and while uh, for he, huge heavy uh, buildings in order to uh, no, um, safely transmit the load the, usually the concrete sections gets uh, heavier uh, heavier beams heavier columns and slabs so this gives large cross sections then resistant to less resistant to seismic and wind loads because you know that the joints are normally very rigid so seismic and wind loads it tend to resist this um, uh, means uh, tends uh, uh, since it is very uh, it's comparatively rigid uh, it's not that much resistant to seismic and wind load because it will not move it's a very rigid structure uh, it's not rigid because we are giving expansion joint addition uh, uh, sufficient joints in the uh, building uh, but even compared to steel it is little rigid so that it is less resistant to the seismic and wind loads now low tensile strength as i explained earlier but come high compressive strength very high compressive strength okay you can give any any amount of compressive strength the concrete will withstand but in the in case of tension it will not withstand okay that is why we are giving reinforcement steel to the concrete now less prone to corrosion that's an advantage to the concrete okay uh, this is very less prone to corrosion you know that okay so uh, even in in case of uh, seaside structures and all uh, you can use um, concrete underwater structures and all you can uh, easily use concrete because uh, the these weathering agents are not uh, you know uh, concrete is very resistant to these weathering agents now let us see does not require highly specialized workforce okay. that is maybe debatable <laughs> because yeah but uh, obviously everybody knows about this construction uh, concrete pouring technology and all uh, we're quite familiar the workforce is now very familiar not like 50 years be, um, uh, ago and all now everybody knows uh, it's very very uh, you know very common type of construction everybody handles this uh, concrete as a building material everybody handles this material so everybody is aware of uh, uh, the technology behind it so very used very easy to use now high self weight yeah definitely high self weight so in case of dams and all you need concrete okay concrete gives you very high self weight uh, where uh, if you are building a gravity dam the basic load resisting capacity or ba the thrust of the water the basic uh, resistance is through the self weight uh, of the dam so in that case also concrete is very good very highly desirable then fire resistant that's all that's another 
that's another another very desirable uh, quality of concrete which is fire resistance this fire resistance on me if you can okay then then we'll move on that is strict uh, quality control uh, required on site this is another another uh, another problem that's uh, it's not a problem actually because as i know we are all familiar with the most of the most of the workers and everybody is familiar with the construction um, uh, requirements uh, of the concrete or uh, quality control measures that has to be um, you know uh, enforced on site so but comparative to steel so there is the quality inspections there, there we should take care that uh, everybody is mixing the, if, if there is an in situ mix is there then we should uh, take care that the correct proportions of the uh, aggregates sand everything has been mixed together steel has been correctly tied i means it has been positioned correctly uh, distance between steel bars everything has to be checked so that quality control aspect is always there okay so that maybe somebody can maybe we can say that it is, a, it is, it is there is a, there is a little bit cost associated with that one because uh, yeah you have to have you have to uh, ensure additional uh, quality control measures at site then next one is okay low construction cost uh, that's okay that's all, that's also the uh, construction compared to other other building materials it is, uh, it is cheaper high durability yeah that everybody knows it's very highly durable weathering agents um, it's not prone to weathering so it's very high dur high durability this is another one uh, one uh, problem with the con concrete construction requires more time for construction so these kind of points you need to remember while answering the the, the question which i mentioned earlier like if, where, when you suggest they will in the scenario they will say that the client needs very urgent something like that they will put in some they will throw in some time constraint so you have to understand that com compared to steel concrete is little bit time taking because the uh, you have to make the form work you have to tie the steel at site and all those things these procedures has to follow so compared to steel yeah definitely concrete concrete construction uh, requires more time okay requires form work yeah that is another 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 thing that we need now this this uh, this requires time for construction we can somehow uh, at some up to certain limit we can overcome because there is pre cost option available okay so uh, we can use pre cost uh, members uh, but again then you have to bring it to the side transportation is a issue if you are very heavy uh, sections concrete sections you are pre casting Uh, bringing it and hoisting it to the position and uh, jointing it everything Th this is an issue okay so you have to weigh e all these all these points you have to weigh against the steel then only you, you will have to come you have to, you have to form your answer or you have to formulate your answer based on all these um, uh, things now let us move on to the other one this is another one a sustainability aspect okay recycling is costly uh, may, uh, Uh, concrete mostly it is not recycled some now recently there are some technologies coming up where this crushed aggregates can be used fly ash can be used uh, for con concrete aggregates maybe even in asphalt also they this this can be used reused things like that some technology has been developed okay some amount of concrete is being re recycled definitely being recycled but it is a costly process compared to steel as we know steel mostly about almost 80% is been recycled now what about steel in contrast to the concrete small cross sections can be built okay how this is steel is a very good building material because it can take steel uh, tension compression everything it can take and uh, uh, very small cross sections okay uh, very small cross section can with with uh, withstand high loads so that is one very desirable because if you are building very high say if you are building a 30 story building or a 50 story building then at uh, the uh, at uh, up, uh, topmost levels or means uh, when uh, the level increases height increases then the cross the weight needs to be reduced okay because otherwise your foundation will be very huge if you are going with very big sections and you cannot uh, you cannot construct that so the sections needs to be light, uh, lightweight uh, so that is where the steel constructions uh, comes in handy okay so, so small cross sections is a very desirable quality of steel more resistant to seismic and wind loads that's that's what i said because it has got the steel we are, we know that connectors and uh, it's, it's less rigid it's not uh, 100% rigid it's less rigid and it is very easily it can be designed for seismic load that is another thing steel can be easily designed for seismic load so that is an advantage to steel then high tensile and compressive strength as uh, we discussed that earlier then prone to corrosion this is one negative of steel okay we all know that okay steel is very um, it is corrosive uh, even if you are exposed to a wet weather or a humid condition it gets corroded it gets corroded 
so that's one required skill workforce that we all know because steel connections steel steel erection uh, all these things require skilled workforce welders um, tech connect, uh, means uh, uh, what do you say uh, then uh, bolting uh, everything needs skilled workforce experienced guys we need otherwise we cannot do it properly okay or we need to train people before we cannot like you know we can um semi skilled workers we cannot use for this kind of work then low self weight that we discussed earlier low self weight uh, again uh, we'll see go not fire resistant that we all know it gets when at temperatures high temperatures steel tends to melt and especially the joint sections uh, it gets melted or melted or it, it, it is not fire resistant not that uh, that much fire resistant and uh, not that much means it's, it's very less fire resistant uh, and but it can be fire proof yeah definitely we need to fire proof it mm, okay uh, one way of fire proofing concrete um, steel sections is embedding it in concrete also that is also one technique okay used uh, then off site fabrication allows for less quality control on site yeah definitely steel whenever we use steel as a construction material we uh, we uh, what we do is uh, we um be prefabricated okay most of the sections are prefabricated like uh, uh, at factory we will design it and uh, this is factory uh, uh, fabricated and then brought on site for installation okay so that is one thing but uh, again here also logistics you have to take care of the logistics you have to design the sections itself like you have, uh, even before uh, you are, you go for prefabrication what you do is normally with steel what happens is you inspect the site you inspect your logistics options at the design stage itself okay that's very important and you see that how far is the fabrication uh, unit and how the sections are going to come in and how we are going to lift it to the uh, the, the higher floors or lift it to its position all these things needs to be considered so while in, in steel so that's one thing the logistic issue is with steel again concrete also there is logistical issue will, will be there okay then higher construction cost definitely steel is costly compared to concrete yeah definitely it is costly material and uh, uh, prefabrications and everything also will take uh, will cost you so these are the things then let us Okay, durability is affected by weather and rusting. Definitely, we discussed that prone to corrosion. We said earlier. Okay, durability is affected sometimes. Now, less construction time. That is very good advantage of steel. Steel can be steel structures can be easily erected. Okay, like you know that uh, while the pre uh, the enabling works and the foundation works is going on the site, the prefabrication can happen at the, the uh, factory. That means the construction time is very much reduced. And uh, uh, then the next point is no form of required. Uh, definitely, no form of required. So these are the positives. Both casting and the precast options available. Uh, that actually is not right. Okay, that is not right. That is that is. I think that has come in from the um, uh, concrete. Okay. So recycling is easy and cost effective. This is a very, uh, this is the most positive point of uh, steel and uh, from the sustainability point of view. Okay, it's, steel can be recycled. Steel structures can be recycled. But most of, uh, almost eighty percent of steel is recycled as per some some, uh, some data. Um, uh, almost eighty percent of steel gets recycled. We all we, we know that, and it is very easy also. Uh, so cost effective also that process. So this makes the steel a very favorable uh, building material. But you have to whenever you answer the question, like I said earlier, you have to weigh each of these uh, scenarios, then answer accordingly. Whether you will go for a concrete frame or you will go for a steel frame, based on that, you to, based on all these keeping all these points in your mind, you have to answer that question. Done. So this is the question which are where would you recommend a concrete frame? Where would you recommend a steel frame? Like I said, you have to consider the cost aspect, your sustainability aspect, logistics issues. Uh, then uh, what type of construction it is? Say it is a um, this one. See another important thing you have to mention is in steel frames the facade is the issue. Means the envelope building envelope is an issue. Okay, you have to think what you will provide as a building envelope. So that is one issue for concrete. Yeah, it's very easy to provide a, a building envelope as well as partition walls. Everything is easy for concrete frames. But the steel frame, it needs. Um, it is little bit uh, you know tricky. So that aspect also you have to take into consideration. But in case of um, uh, some warehouse, you have to um, uh, build a warehouse. There is no issue. Just uh, simply you can use some corrugated sheet to cover the entire uh, workshop. Okay. So that kind of options you have to. Uh, think then answer this one, this these kind of questions. Let us move on. 
the next uh, structural element or next um, uh, yeah superstructure element is floors okay what is the functional definition of a floor what is a floor okay we will have a functional definition to provide a floor space on upper levels that is above the lowest floor level as i said the lowest floor level will go in the substructure and above the upper levels all the upper levels form part of floor except for roof okay that topmost one is the roof uh, okay so what are the different types of floors we will see so this is flat slab okay it's a two way reinforced concrete slab that usually does not have beams or girders and uh, loads are transferred directly to support this is a two way slab actually what are the, what is in the picture is a two way slab it does not have beams that is the most important point you have to look at two way slab don't have beams because two way slab transmit directly to the column they don't need beam, beams okay some in some cases especially large slabs yeah definitely beams are required uh, if the span span is too much okay so in other cases normal uh, smaller spans can be directly transmitted to the um, column without this now composite slabs are there ribbed slabs are made what is a composite slab okay this is this is an, this is also an, uh, you know a composite slab actually it, it should this problem here okay composite slab is the one which is in the below actually and the ribbed slab is the one above and there is some problem here okay anyway composite slab. what is a composite slab the composite slab means there is a concrete there is there will be con uh, corrugated shape. there will be no form work actually for this particular slab because there will be corrugated sheet will be laid at the bottom and the concrete is poured onto the corrugated sheet and it is left as it is it is not removed there is no need or no uh, requirement of a form work as a ribbed slab means these are for uh, higher spans like you know the when the span is high they, you can use criss cross beams like small beams throughout the span and then cast a very thin slab on top Uh, the slab, the slab, the, the slab's purpose is not to transmit the load, but it is to just serve as a platform. Uh, that load will be transmitted through these ribbed beams. The beams you can see in the topmost, the uh, top figure, the, there are it's like a checkered um, beams here, uh, longitudinal as well as the uh, um, length as well as breadth. There are beams, small beams, not uh, very big beams like uh, you say uh, load transmitting beams, but these are small beams which will transmit the load to the uh, end bearing wall or the columns. and the, uh, the slab will be very thin now so another another thing is you know, now we have seen um, uh, floors different types of floors now based on the uh, based on the uh, based on whether it is uh, pre stressed or not pre stressed how it is uh, uh, you know classified pre stressing what is pre stressing pre stressing in the sense means it is it is pre stressed as the name indicates what is pre stressed mean the load before the load is applied onto the lab say uh, that we have casted the slab and uh, what happens is what well, there will be dead load coming from the high, um, top floors or maybe there will be live load uh, people moving around or whatever it is all these loads will come come into the slab uh, on top of the slab which is the live load okay then only the slab gets what stressed that is the application of the load before that application of the load what happens is slab is free there is no load onto the slab but in case of pre stressing before the live load or dead load acts upon it that it's at that stage itself the slab is stressed that is pre stressing why this is done is to increase the load bearing capacity of the slab that's all how it is done is you know using tendons we are we will um, we will pass uh, you know ducts in through the, the for uh, you know Uh, what to say the the ducts will be passed now in through the uh, slab structure uh, and along the ducts cables will be drawn cables will be pre um, high tensile steel, um, steel cables will be drawn along the these ducts and then these will be tensed uh, be this will be tightened to this will be attached to a jacks which will tighten this uh, these uh, strings or these tendons and these tendons will induce stress on the slab okay and this is there is this is called pre stressing basically this is pre stressing this can happen in girders also okay not only in slabs pre stressing can happen in can we can use this in girders uh, and all sorts of structures all sorts of uh, tensile structures we can use mostly uh, wherever the load is transmitted along a span we can use pre stressing so in this pre stressing uh, this uh, this uh, in the pre stressing there is pre tensioning and post tensioning there are two items okay what is pre tensioning and post tensioning pre tensioning means before the concrete is poured the tensioning has been done that is pre tensioning post tensioning means after the concrete is poured and it is attained its strength then the tensioning is done so these are the two type two 
basic this is the basic difference between pre tensioning and post tensioning see pre tensioning steel is pulled before the concrete is poured post tensioning means after the concrete is poured okay so these are the two types of pre stressing and this is called uh, this is basically the technology behind the pt slab now close see post tension concrete slab this is a, a common question in uh, apc what is it what do you mean by or what do you understand by uh, pre or post tension the concrete slab pt slab so same this is the answer that we have to give what is pre, pre uh, post tensioning post tensioning means once the concrete has been done cured everything has been done once it attains strength the tendons will be tightened and stress will be induced okay to the slab okay before any live load or dead load is acted upon it so that is pre stressed the slab is pre stressed this is called pt slab what is advantage of this this will take more load and more uh, larger spans can be this can be created okay same load can be transmitted through th uh, thinner sections of slab so these are the advantages of post tensioning now post tension we can see the definition here uh, slabs use high strength tension the steel strand to compress the slabs keep majority of the concrete in compression uh, give this gives very efficient structure with minimum material usage decreases economic span range see and uh, when compared to reinforced concrete normal concrete so these are the advantages of pt slab now next structural element is roof okay we will see what are the types of roofs we know fun the functional definition is to prov provide a horizontal component of the external enclosing envelope okay this is the functional de uh, definition of a roof roof's function is to provide the horizontal component topmost component okay uh, external walls will provide the horizontal that means uh, the vertical component and horizontal component will be provided by the roof so types of roofs flat roofs these are all you know these are all uh, i will just uh, i will just put a uh, pitched roof uh, i will just go through the uh, shell roofs and domes okay by the names itself you can all understand this these are all very quite uh, quite familiar terms and these are all level 1 questions uh, you can you can you can see the level uh, the, uh, definitions maybe somebody can ask you what is a flat roof what do you understand if you want if you are uh, especially when you are writing some, uh, something about roof uh, in your uh, uh, somebody of experience and they will ask different types of roofs are you aware of this then pitched roof yeah shell roof shell is means uh, curved surface means it's it's, it's kind of very small thin shell or uh, 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 means the shell roof may be defined as a curved surface okay curved it's it's, it's just a shell kind of roof that's the thickness of which is very small compared to other diamonds shell means it is a very you know, shell, the component which makes the shell roof will be the thickness will be very small means it's it's kind of a sheet actually okay then uh, domes domes we know we all come across domes here okay so we know domes what type of domes we, it can be masonry as well as concrete okay domes can be constructed masonry as well as uh, concrete so let we'll go to the next element structural element is external walls okay now external elements what is the uh, functional element uh, functional definition i have just given uh, previously this is a vertical component of the external enclosing envelope okay so major functions of an external wall what is the major functions of an external wall uh, why do we need an external wall okay very uh, environmental control environmental control means uh, the weathering agent should not reach inside okay we should have a habitable uh, we should have a habitable space inside the building that's what it is and because that means rain water should not come inside excessive wind dust everything should not come inside weathering agent should not uh, come into the building uh, the area uh, which we have uh, the building should have a habitable environment so that is the environmental control okay it uh, heat cold nothing okay uh, it should not it should to control all these weathering agents then security the second one is big security yeah, of course external element would be strong and sturdy it should have it should have uh, enough security means the persons living in said to have security then privacy of course fire control yeah definitely some it should not it should be fireproof also i mean it should have some fire resistance it's not be easily easily you know uh, things now aesthetics uh, that we all know appearance external appearance Okay, that's why we do. We go for um, these beautiful kinds of facades and all. We should have uh, some aesthetic uh, appeal for the building. So I am just um, uh, different types of you know, building materials used for facade. G R G R P G R C cladding. We are familiar with this one. This type of buildings. Masonry stone. Yeah, of course. External walls can be constructed using masonry. Then concrete. Definitely concrete. Then glass panels. Yeah, we have seen glass facades. Many glass facades. Then metal panels. Yeah, that's also timbers. Okay. these are the different types of materials which you use for in um, uh, constructing external walls so this gives you a general awareness about the external walls what their function is 
uh, okay uh, what is the purpose and what are the different materials we commonly use now internal walls and partition next element is internal walls and partitions what is the functional devolution to divide the floor space that means you will have a floor in a frame construction there will be no walls internal walls just the floor is there and columns and beams are there then comes the internal walls the purpose is to partition that means to divide it into different different rooms as per utility whatever you define okay so that is the purpose of the internal wall types of partitions type partition walls what are the types of partition walls we'll go across what are the different commonly used okay it can be classified based on its structural detail and the material detail based on structural how you can classify the partitions it can be either load bearing or non load bearing okay of course you, you have seen in our normal house construction we use load bearing walls okay because the load is transmitted via the walls internal walls as well as the external walls so it could that that kind of walls whether the load is transmitted via the walls then it's that kind of walls or partitions whatever it may be those are called load bearing structures so the other one is non load bearing structures especially this kind of construction comes in the frames okay frames as i told you earlier the load is transmitted via columns and beams okay there is no load transmitted onto the walls so especially in frame structures the walls will be in especially internal walls will be non load bearing okay now based on the material let us see what is the base based on the material based on the material it is it says brick masonry gypsum walls part, partition walls then we we all know wooden partition wall yeah definitely we all know this glass partition walls then straw board partitions yeah so these are the different types of materials common type of materials there are other materials also but commonly we come across these kind of materials for internal walls so just to give you an idea awareness about this particular element uh, these are the items we use these are the terms basic terms that you need to keep in mind okay while preparing for your apc then these are the photographs certain photographs here just just to give you an awareness just you these are just uh, photograph just to enable the you know as i have a visual effect of what we were discussing earlier gypsum gypsum i just have given a cross section here so just we we all know the cross section of gypsum we are we all use this kind of the, the this kind of material in our uh, in projects so gypsum board will be there stud walls will be there and then fibrous cavity insulation that will be there then drainage gap there is particular uh, then uh, water control layer that is a insulation layer will be there okay then both sides uh, it will be covered with uh, the, the, it can be both side or single side or maybe double walls also can come okay so such type of composite structures are used for in the gypsum wall construction then timber wall frame okay timber wall is also the external part will be timber then behind that there will be studs same as in uh, similar to uh, gypsum wall there will be studs insulated material vapor material everything will be there but the external face will be uh, timbers so that is timber frame walls okay then then we will move on i think the time is um, catching up okay i will just fast now this uh, just uh, uh, speed up my presentation now finishes functional definition is to provide a functional and or decorative finish to the building elements we know what is finish we don't have to you know um, elaborately explain all these things we all know that okay then again uh, different types okay different categories under this finishes wall finishes floor finishes ceiling finishes these are the three finishes then uh, uh, wall finishes means wall finishes okay there, there is it's not sub subdivided into sub elements but in floor finishes finishes to floor raised access floors are there then finishes to ceiling for ceiling demountable suspended ceilings okay these are the sub elements they given okay now let's move on wall finishes types of wall finishes <coughs> let us see wall finishes different types dry finishes and wet finishes of course dry finishes we have plaster board uh, timber paneling and carpet okay wall finishes you know all these kind of you have come across all these kind of finishes okay wet finishes means plaster will be there yeah paint will be there wall paper then walls now wall tiles and natural stones etc these whatever we use for this uh, wall finishes these are the different types commonly used types okay uh, then plaster okay different types of plaster okay you can ask a level one question what are the different types of plaster you have come across okay there are different lime plaster cement plaster mud plaster stucco plaster stucco plaster it's just it's a ready made plaster which gives a very fine finish uh, as in the it can have various textures it comes in various uh, textures it is usually a uh, three layer um, finish uh, okay so it's applied in three layers so that's that's known as stucco plaster then lime plaster uh, what is lime plaster what is the difference between lime plaster and the cement plaster lime plaster the binding metal is lime 
whereas in cement plaster the binding metal is cement so that's the basic difference between these two so the mud plaster it's no uh, some some kind of some we can see mud plaster also is nowadays used in sustainable construction and all yeah they are, they do things like that uh, we use uh, things like the, uh, such things then stucco plus we discussed all these things okay then let us see floor finishes different types of floor finishes let us see what are the different types of floor finishes okay tiles of course wood yeah wood paneling is there pvc natural stones vinyl floorings carpet synthetic finishes synthetic finishes in the sense means yeah um, for sporting arenas and all you know we we provide there are many synthetic finishes are all in playgrounds children play areas yeah then epoxy systems of course in the parking lots and all you might have seen this one uh, then warehouse we give epoxy systems as flooring finishes okay just some photographs just to give a, a, an overall uh now it's it's just uh, uh, just to give an overall idea uh, visual effect only uh, we all know these kind of uh, flooring systems or finishing systems okay uh, then we'll move on ceiling finishes different types of ceiling finishes other uh, plaster board and screen suspended ceilings upvc cladding timber boarded ceiling metal panels you might have you might have seen all these type of uh, type of ceiling finishes in your projects very commonly used types okay metal panels are there upvc cladding suspended ceilings okay this is timber board ceiling and last one is plaster board plaster board that you, you can see that then fittings furnishings the fourth element okay now we are uh, okay. okay now fittings furnishings and equipments fittings uh, fittings furnishings and equipments you know uh, what is uh, what do you mean by this one okay general the, this is the Uh, under this fittings furnishings and equipment there are certain sub categories or sub elements are there general fittings then domestic kitchen fittings and equipments special purpose fittings furnishings and equipment special purpose in the sense means uh, gyms okay sports uh, items or things like that okay so the uh, such such uh, special purpose fittings will come okay and then uh, signs and notices of course exit signs you can see all, all sorts of in public buildings there will be sign boards then work of art work of art means uh, paintings statues all these kind of things then non mechanical and non electrical equipments internal planting of course there are internal planting if, if you are giving any um, if, if the client wants any you know uh, plants or plantings to be done then that has that will come under this fittings and finishings bird and vermin control these are these are just some photographic uh, you know just to identify uh, easily identify the items uh, general fittings means of see that is an office furniture fitted out furniture office furniture works of art there is a painting hanging behind the bowl then yeah special for nice gym gym equipments signs and noti uh, notices internal planning kitchen equipments these are all from the figure itself you will understand what these uh, terms means so just simply supply items actually uh, then okay then there is another question regard in fittings and furnishing there is another question can come what is shell and core building okay normally this is also a very common question in the ipc what is a shell and core building what is it by definition what shell and core means that it's a building technique that involves developers that means in effect it's only shell and core is built there is nothing no it's not fitted out okay no, no finishes nothing okay it will consist what what will what, what will be there owner creates a basic shell for renders to of it normally happens in rent, rental buildings where the where the uh, the person who is leasing the property will have his own what his own ideas or his own requirements specific requirements he doesn't want an already readily fitted out um, uh, what uh, facility because he might have his own unique facility requirements so in usually this concept actually originated in america where they they what they the owners what they found out was whenever they try to rent out these kind of guys they they come came in and strip out everything and then they refitted it so this is kind of waste of money also okay uh, and uh, this guy is time consuming also so in such cases they came up with the idea of shell and core building where there will be no finishes the structure and core of the building is finished including external works external walls everything will be there but internally it will not be fitted out okay so this this is easy to customize that is a major advantage of this one the most shell and core provisions provide okay what are, what are the provisions included structure of the building of course cladding on the building of course base paint base plan of the building yeah plant Ex um, external work such as hardscaping softscaping including fencing drainage etc all these things will be there external works will be there 
base plant including mechanical electrical systems yeah whatever electrical system the connection might have been there okay uh, this means the major connections will be there uh, fire detection system of course fire detection system obviously it, it is required so these are these are the, uh, the uh, this is what is called shell and core this is what is included in the shell and core building now let us move on the fifth element which is services especially mep services yeah we will see sanitary installations water installations space heating and air conditioning of course ventilation systems of course electrical installations lift and conveyor systems these are all by word it's by definition itself these are all identifiable quite um, common terms communication security control systems specialist installations now this any builders work yeah builders work associated with this obviously we know that what is builders work we have to allow for the builders work always uh, related to mep works okay then uh, water mains sub elements water installations water main supply cold water distribution hot water distribution okay these are the three elements sub categories space heating central heating central cooling okay ventilation system central ventilation smoke extract control these are the sub elements which comes under this one electrical installations electrical mains sub mains distribution power installations all these things okay you just just can uh, we, we we can just read through actually uh, not much uh, in detail uh, much to go into a lift enclosed hoist these are all uh, what is included in uh, these services okay fire fighting system suppression systems and communication systems okay special systems okay now we will move on services what is building management system there is again another common question okay what is a build what do you understand by a building management system obviously it comes under the services mep category we will see what is the definition okay. bm systems are intelligent microprocessor based controller networks monitors controls building buildings technical system means it's, it's a master controller of all the technical systems it coordinates all the services such as air condition ventilation lighting hydraulics everything is controlled okay so this is it, everything is managed not only controlled it is managed that's called the building management system okay uh, individual pieces are functionally individual pieces of the building equipment operates on a complete integrated system this means it, all individual pieces are linked together to operate as a one integrated system this is what is the purpose of the building management system okay now let's move on external works okay what are the external works site preparation works okay roads pathways pavings hard softscaping then again fencing railing walls external fixtures okay site clearance include site clearance and preparatory ground works preparatory means these are part of maybe part of enabling works package if there is an enabling works package for a building then these will be part of that particular work then softscaping seeding turfing external planting irrigation systems fencing railings okay these are all quite familiar terms so these are the external works elements and these are the sub elements under the external work so now let us go on so these are some other questions okay uh, i think with this external works we have concluded the uh, various elements of the building uh, like starting from the um, facilitating works to the external works uh, of course as i said uh, this prefabrication has been excluded okay so that uh, that is not included in this slide that maybe in some other session maybe we will have to uh, do that prefabrication uh, various techniques uh, sustain its sustainability aspects etc et has to be discussed okay and uh, i think the next one okay some common questions which i feel uh, always whenever uh, when it comes in the apc uh, what is right of light party wall and party wall act okay these are quite common questions which uh, comes in the apc anybody can answer any of the question what is right of light have any, anybody heard of this one it's quite common term actually if anybody can answer okay let us see the right of light essentially means right to light that's all as the term dictates but it is does not work like that actually if a person so um, he the, uh, we will read the definition a right to light refers to the light right to receive sufficient light and so the, through an opening such as a window huh? all ordinary comfort is uh, but cannot be actually easily um, like not as easy as this he should have that right means or he should be enjoying that right by prescription or maybe there are some law, uh, uh, law terms like prescription means he was continuously using it for the last 20 years or so 
oh he was enjoying that and uh, there is a one more question what is the reasonable level of this right that also is there okay there is no the law has not uh, dictated that particular right no? so this much level you should receive that is not there okay what the courts does is they actually they um, on a case by case basis they determine all these things but essentially what the law says is if you are enjoying and if you are having or if you are enjoying that uh, light or if you are sufficiently if you, if you are not if you are denied of that right then that is not right okay if some an adjacent building comes up some builder comes up and build this build build a building very close to your window and uh, cutting off your air, um, light and everything then uh, that is definitely a pro in issue okay so that is what is covered under this right of light but of course this has to be the each case by case this has to be um, verified okay what is a party wall this is another very uh, interesting question which is comes up in the uh, very uh, very often in the apc so what is a party wall party wall is nothing but what what it says is uh, a shared wall that's all if two adjacent plots uh, one two adjacent plots are there owned by two different parties and then there is a wall okay common to both of them then that is called a party wall okay it, it not only on the boundary wall even in case of buildings also shared walls between buildings also is a party wall we will we will see what is a party wall in detail party wall is a party wall if it stands astride the boundary of a land belonging to two or more different owners what is what we discussed now okay such a wall it's a part of one building it can be part of one building it or separates two or more buildings it can separate or consist of a party fence wall okay i mean it be it could be a fence wall also now what is party wall act what does the act says no 1996 in uk they promulgated a, la a law saying uh, it's called party wall act which gives a framework for resolving disputes between adjacent parties who is having a party wall or who is sharing a party wall okay neighboring properties property owners if they have any dispute how they will discuss so means if, what kind of works can be one can undertake if i am i am also having one phases if uh, me and another party is sharing this wall then one phases to me uh, and the other phases to him so what all works i can do can i demolish the wall can i run a service through the wall can i uh, fit a light and all these kind of things this wall, uh, party wall dictates okay let us see the scenarios okay the, this is this is available in internet this uh, this um, uh, in what these um, uh, illustrations but anyway just for the presentation sake we'll just go through that run through the scenario one gives the 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 dotted line is the boundary line okay in this case the wall is not shared but it is on the boundary line if the buildings are not sharing the wall but it is on the boundary line so that also is a part, uh, party wall in the scenario two both buildings are sharing the wall okay so this is also a party wall now see the flat scenario so it's a flat means one apartment is above the other and other above the other like that so the floor is now a party wall it's a party structure actually it's not a party wall it's not called a party wall it's a party structure then scenario 4 you can see that in the, this is interesting scenario where you can see that the garage and the bedroom is sharing a wall that is a party wall but on, on the top it is not a party wall second floor wall which is not shared is not a party wall okay that is what the act dictates now scenario 5 is a boundary wall where the wall is on the boundary so this is about the party walls and i think that's it that concludes uh, the presentation so i think uh, we are almost time also is 8:53 now so if any question anybody has any question they can please uh, raise the question anybody has any any questions we have almost 10 minutes now left yeah one guy has asked me to share the powerpoint with us uh, we uh, we will do that we'll do that uh, we uh, actually uh, i will comment on that you can comment in the group uh, for this one uh, okay mm, then uh, this group admins will decide on this one definitely okay we'll see what we can do okay so some guys uh, any questions any any questions related to whatever we, we, you have or in your project experience or anything like that related to our our uh, limited to our uh, presentation or this presentation please can share here we'll try to discuss
Okay, I'll be here anyway. Another five five more minutes is there till nine o'clock. I'll be online because I'm not seeing much questions here in this uh, comment section. Anyway, uh, I can I can't see any more, any more comments here. Okay, then I think we will conclude it. But for everybody's um, uh, attention, what I would suggest is, uh, as APC aspirants, uh, take this PowerPoint only as okay. Okay, one second, one second. Yeah, now I I can I can see the comments now. How many questions uh, usually ask CSK? Uh, okay, how many questions do they ask? One second. Let me answer this one by one. Okay, maybe I, okay. Any good reference book or articles for this topic for additional reading? Okay, definitely in the internet you can find many many articles are there. Textbooks are also available, but I cannot remember the exact names of those to give any reference. Uh, but there are there definitely there are uh, textbooks on this one. You can find it many many of them. But I would suggest, as I uh, told you, I would suggest you to go through the BCIS uh, this cost plan format. Okay, the, that gives you very very good idea of different elements. And uh, that you can give uh, keep it as a framework for your further readings. That will give you a very very. Uh, it is a very good uh, very good document. And the additional additional uh, 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 advantage is that you can learn about the cost plans also. Design economics that is comes under the design economics competency. You can learn about the cost plans also. Okay. Can you explain about deep foundation? Okay. Actually, with deep foundations, we have explained there are uh, pile pilings. We have different types of piles. Uh, all these things we have uh, explained already, okay. And uh, indeed, deep, there are other types of defoundations also. It's not limited to piling, but of course, uh, the the presentation and the time limits are there. We cannot discuss every items, but the commonly asked the questions is about piles because we are in, uh, in our day to day thing. We are coming across piles only. Okay, so you expect questions. You if you are writing and if you are writing. About any specialist deep foundation in your uh, summary of experience, definitely you should um, uh, be ready to answer at level three on that that subject because panel will definitely question you on that one. Then, does it mean that when concrete floor is post tension, that deflection is eliminated? No, it's not the case. Post tension does not mean that the deflection is eliminated. It says that the concrete in the post tension slab will be in a compression state. That means it is already stressed in the opposite direction. Okay, it will be the slabs usually take the tension. Compression is also there, very little, but tension okay, because it is it, it deflects under the load. But now already we have bent the uh, but bent the slab in the opposite direction. We have compressed it. Now first, what happens in this is now if you apply, for example, a 10 kilo newton load onto the lab a slab, okay, the slab will deflect under the 10 kilo newton load. Now in a post tension case. 10 kilo newton load is applied, same 10 kilo newton load is applied onto the slab. Now that's the, what the 10 kilo newton has to do. It has to first overcome the compression because already it is it is compressed in the opposite direction. First it has to eliminate the compression, then additional load only will deflect the slab. Okay, the, It does not mean that the deflection is, the load bearing capacity of the slab itself is enhanced. That is what uh, the uh, pre, uh, post tension does to the slab. And in other words, what we can explain is this uh, basically we don't need to have uh, too much load bearing capacity for the slab because we know the load coming onto the slab we have a design okay we know the live load and the dead load which is act going to act upon the um, slab for its entire lifetime so that is why the the slab has been designed so if it is not pre um, post tension what happens is maybe it is uh, the slab thickness required is 30 mm but now if you post tension use post tension then the slab thickness becomes 20 mm or 15 mm. That is the difference. 
But where the advantage is in high rise constructions, 30 mm to 50 mm, 15 mm uh, slab thickness reduction means that much dead load has been reduced. That means it, it gets, gives you an edge in the high rise constructions. So that is what is the post tension. Now, what is a floating column? Okay, I'll come back to that on it. Uh, okay, any example to write SOE up to level 3 in this competence? Okay, so this uh, level 3 experience should come from basically from your, uh, you know, what, what do you say, your uh, experience. You should write from your um, project examples. Uh, level 3 advice, uh, you have to see. See, you have given, you, have, you may have definitely prepared variations. So you can, you can, uh, and these variations will have, definitely will have some construction technology related things to it. So elaborate on that, think on that one, and you, you definitely you can, you can come up with, and you, you have to um, write from your experience. That is mandatory. Okay. So uh, try to elaborate on that. You may have advised your um, um, commercial manager, not necessarily client your manager, your management, things like that you might have advised. So you can convert that uh, experience to the level 3. RICS competency is in the last. Uh, uh, why, which RICS competency APC panel will ask the question about construction technology and environment services? Is it in, no, it is not in design economics. Design economics is separate competency, construction technology is separate competency. Okay. Uh, but the, you will have to answer questions from design economics. You will have to answer from construction technology. Both. Which piles? Okay. Now, precast and cast in situ. When will you advise? Okay. If, if will you advise precast or will you advise cast in situ? So now again, precast or cast in situ. Uh, normally, precast piles it, uh, depends upon the soil conditions and design load also. Because precast piles, what happens is you have to drive the pile onto the ground. Okay, precast pile is uh, the precast pile will have a shoe at the end, usually made of a metal shoe, which is driven onto the ground, possibly. Okay, so so that uh, that type of construction, if it is possible, if you uh, if it is not possible, then you can you cannot do that, and then the construction technology aspect also comes in. Okay, your equipments or all the all these things, what you have, you have uh, you 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 have there. And then cast in situ. Now boring. You, uh, for cast in city, you have to bore it to the uh, depth, required depth. Then you have to put in the steel uh, reinforcement and then you have to put uh, concrete. So you have to bring the concrete in. All these things you have to uh, you know, uh, compare. You have to consider while answering this question. Of course, environmental services, we have environmental services in the sense is the as sustainability aspect of the construction technology. That is what we have to discuss. Even the prefabrication comes under this uh, this uh, this section. Uh, but uh, yeah, definitely we will try because two hour session uh, uh, to cover both of this, it's a real challenge. Uh, we will think on that one when we, we can do have a, uh, because even environmental services, you will cover in um, your mandatory competencies such as uh, sustainability. Okay, So these are interlinked competencies. Uh, so we'll see how this can with this we can we can work out this okay how to structure level 3 answer for this particular company need a brief example i have already given you an example like will uh, which construction uh, which um, uh, structure you will advise for a warehouse okay you have your client needs a warehouse how will you advise now the warehouse is in a very congested area how will you advise now the warehouse is in a desert area how will you advise so these are the questions you need to consider while answering to the level three such questions you need to answer you, you need to formulate questions like this then you need to answer this one how to answer this one i already discussed because you have to consider you have to consider what you have to consider the um, um, pros and cons means you have to critically consider what is required on the um, what is the positives of con on concrete what is the positive negatives of the concrete what is the positive of the steel what is it so such like critically you have to appraise and write that is how you will write a level 3 example. But this level 3 example has to come from your personal experience. Not You should not, like, you cannot, you cannot write like anything. Because panel will definitely challenge you on level 3 examples. And you have to answer accordingly. Okay. Now I think uh, the time is also up. 9.04 now. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for your questions. And thank you for attending this session. Hope you all have a very nice journey for in attaining your APC, um, completing your APC, as well as attaining the MRICS charter membership. Uh, best of luck to you all, guys. Stay safe and thank you.